Good afternoon, everyone. It is now three o'clock. We will begin. Uh, as a disclaimer, we're going to be recording this uh, session. The, um, the questions can be directed during the presentation via the chat and also uh, via chat after the uh, formal part of the presentation ends. So next slide. I'm Tony Beck. I'm a program officer at NIGMS. I manage not only the STEM gaming SVR, STTR, but also a program called SEPA, Science Education Partnership Award, which is a pre-K to grade 12 workforce diversity. Um, MJ, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, I am a DSO, a scientific review officer to do the peer review of the applications coming up for the SVIR, STTR, IDM applications. And Brian? Um, hi, good afternoon. I'm Brian Iglesias. I'm a grants management specialist, and I deal with the administrative and fiscal portion of the grants. Next slide, please. Okay, today's agenda is going to be packed. Uh, we're going to hit some of the topics um, somewhat lightly and over a flyover, and others we'll discuss in more detail. But this is a lot of information. It'll take a little over an hour to cover it. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's the opportunity to uh, provide questions during the presentation and afterwards. And um, we hope we can uh, give you a, really an overview. There's a lot of detail. And if you have questions about a specific component, um, the, at the back of the funding announcement, about two pages from the end is a list of people to contact. So if it's questions about the, the program itself, the funding announcement, or the sessions I or the components I talked about, you can email me. And similarly for MJ for review and Brian for the grants management. So we're going to cover, do an overview of this program. Um, MJ will talk about the grant review process at the NIH. I'll talk about human subjects because these projects involve teachers and students, and so you have participants, therefore you have to deal with a few human subject issues. Brian will tell you everything you ever wanna know about the, the budget, and then we'll take you inside a review and, and give you a sense of the kinds of discussions go on about an application by the assigned uh, reviewers. Next slide, please. So the SBR SCTR program was created back in the 80s by Congress. It was a, a an effort to do several things. Uh, we have the bullets here. Um, to provide uh, R&D, to increase the private sector investment. And so the, the federal government often invests in research projects um, and often these result in companies forming. And this is a, this is a way to uh, provide the early support for these companies. Uh, technological, technological innovation is, is key because small companies and uh, companies run by underserved uh, groups, women, minorities, and so on, these tend to be much more creative and free thinking than maybe a large corporation. Um, and then through the SCTR program, it, it makes it easier to take technology developed in a academic or medical institution to the commercial market. Next slide, please. So the, these are just a couple caveats. So, um, in terms of the original genesis of this program and the things we try to encourage. And so um, it's competitive grants, but they're for companies that have ideas that are uh, promising. It may just be an idea, it may be a prototype, but the ideas are unproved, unproven. And having spent a decade in biotech, uh, it's, you know, you're in a difficult situation where you've got some cool ideas, but you don't have any intellectual property and you talk to the venture capitalists and they'll give you money, but you end up giving away most of your company. So it is a dilemma. And so this is why the SBIR program, it's, it's too risky for the VC. If the VC get a 50X one time in 10, they're happy. But as you see, this is a, a way to support companies where the risk is diminished once they, they get the SBIR funding because a phase one plus phase two is about three years and $2.1 billion. And so you should be, most companies should be able to move forward um, with that kind of an investment. Next slide, please. So um, many of you have heard about the value of death or experienced it. And this is where you're, you're, you're coming to get started. 
and you have a product that's looking very good, but you have no revenues and sooner or later you start running out of money. And this is where you go um, going to the investment fairs and so on and try to get some venture capital money. But the, the SBIR program, you see down at the bottom, 2.1 million over three years, this really allows you to bridge the valley of death. And, and in many cases uh, with this kind of funding and this amount of time, you not only can create a product, but you can do some educational research and figure out um, not by trial and error, but by basic research and driving hypothesis that if we tweak this, this approach to education, let's see what happens with some reasonable evaluation. Next slide. So there's, there's two programs, the SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research, and this is 3.2% of an entity's budget. And the STTR, as I mentioned, this is uh, a little less, it's 0.45%. And um, again, the SBIR is small companies and the STTR is where you, you partner with an academic institution. Next slide, please. What does an SBIR, STTR firm look like? And I always chuckle when I see this, that the first bullet, it's a small, it's a company with under 500 people. I spent a decade in biotech and uh, I, I was with one company, um, probably had 500 people. So it's a large number. Most of the folks we chat with are small companies are getting started. Um, and so one of the realities of this is often the research plan is, includes the, the key personnel with a company, but also subcontractors. The work has to be done in the US and the focus is R&D. You can't go down to Radio Shack, uh, get a basket full of equipment and assemble something. So it is basic research and our, these are our mechanism, the research mechanism. Next slide, please. So the phase one in an SBR, STTR, it's six months to a year, it's concept of a proof of principle. You create the device, you do some limited testing and it gives you enough information to move forward. The phase two, oh, and the, the uh, phase one is six page research plan. We'll talk about that a little later. So phase two is prototype. So you've got, uh, it's a two year up to about $2 million. It has a 12 page research plan and a 12 page commercialization plan. So you can see that the phase one it really doesn't have a commercialization plan, but it's good to talk about the market where you fit in and a couple ideas about how you're gonna market your product. Next slide. Okay, there's also a fast track. So this is where you, you have a lot of uh, momentum. Your company's been doing this for a while. You're, you're skilled at submitting grants to the NIH. Um, it's a reality that experience with S SBIR, SCTR applications at NSF and ED, uh, it's a great experience, but the process is very different. So the grant proposals are a little different. And there's also a direct to phase two. So this is where you've got some pilot studies, basically what you would, you would accomplish in a phase one and you jump right to the phase two. But whenever you have a, a phase, direct to phase two, it's always good to contact uh, the program officer, which would be me or uh, a program officer listed for the omnibus solicitation, which we'll talk about as well. Next slide, please. So what are the differences? So the partnering, the SBR permits it, the SCTR requires that you have a research institution. The principal investigators, so these are the PIs or people running the show. It could be a multi-PI team where you have two or three people and one contact person, or it could be a single individual. But their primary employment has to be with the small business. With the SCTR, it could be either. Division of work with the SBIR, you make subcontract up to 33% and 50% for the phase two. SDTR, uh, you can see the division 40 30. And the SBC, the small business concern, is always the applicant and the awardee. And so the PI has to be loosely affiliated with the applicant organization. Next slide. So there's a lot of information online. Um, a great place to get started is the FAQ at the SEED. Uh, they cover lots and lots of stuff. And uh, you know that's down at the bottom. And they're also the, S the FAQ for the uh, SBR to STTR. So if you have any questions, um, that's the first place to go. If you can't find what you need, then contact me if it's about the, um, the science or the kind of projects. If it's a question about the, re, the application process, you can contact MJ. And if you have a budget question, contact Brian. Next slide, please. So let's talk about this particular funding announcement. So it's been around for about a decade. It's called Interactive Digital Media. Um, 
and but it's basically SBI or SCTR using gaming of any sort, any platform for education. It could be for training or a lot of things. So this is an R43, R44 mechanism. You can see the second bullet has the funding amounts. The, the next receipt date is September 5th this year and thereafter the fifth and the next two years. Review is in October, November, and the early start dates will be April of next year. Next slide, please. So the purposes. So uh, I won't belabor this, but you know, interactive digital media or gaming is used for a lot of techni technical uh, science, uh, gaming, you know, the about 25% of, of kids under, or people under 18 are gamers. About 50% are between uh, 18 and about 40 or 50. So it's a, it's a technology or it's a, a technology, I'd say, that is widely uh, used for a lot of different reasons. And so this one, this particular program evolved out of the pre-K to grade 12 program. So part of it is disseminate biomedical science. It's a fun way to learn. And many of the programs have what I call a, a, a hook. So one of the projects we fund, it's called Extra Innings. So it uses baseball as a hook to teach kids about statistics, math, and physics. They're having a good time working in teams. Um, gaming can in increase interest in science. Uh, problem solving skills are really important, not only individually, but as working in teams. Next slide, please. Um, we've seen more and more programs using VR, or some other uh, high-tech <coughs> uh, approach to teaching people. And shortly after COVID arrived, we funded a number of projects using VR to teach uh, health service training, such as pulmonary therapists. They were in high demand, and this is a faster, uh, more inexpensive way to do it. Uh, when you're targeting the, the younger kids, it should be age, grade, culturally appro appropriate, and um, you know, probably preaching to the choir, but if the technology of the platform is too expensive for your target audience, it's probably not gonna sell well. And the last part is something that NIGMS really encourages. Uh, data science and statistical skills are really important. And so projects that will address this are very, very highly sought after. Next slide, please. Uh, some more processes, many gaming, uh, particularly for the educational field, allow the teachers to have a dashboard or some mechanism, not only to see how the class is progressing through the project, but also to see um, what they're learning. It's also very important. Okay, this, this next part is uh, prior to 2023, there was a separate funding announcement called NOFOS, Notification of Funding Opportunity, for the SBIR SDTR. Um, NIGM opted to defer to the, what's called the omnibus solicitation. So this is, um, it's the second bullet down on the bottom. And it's a, it's a solicitation, it's, it's a more generic. It covers the CDC, NSF, NIH, a few other agencies. And within the NIH, it covers all the 20, or mo most of the 27 institutes and centers. And so, um, but everything about it is the same. So the topics, the budget and so on, the application date and so on. Um, one of the confusing things is the receipt date because um, the, the omnibus has three receipt dates. They go to a, a standing panels on January 5th, April 5th, and September 5th. And the September 5th is also the due date for the uh, IDM. So keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna turn it over to MJ and you can learn about the peer review process and the criteria used to um, grade and judge the competitive value of a grant application. So MJ, please. Yeah. Um, so basically, it won't tell you exactly how to write the application, but knowing what the reviewers are looking for, that should inform you how to best write an application to be competitive. So next slide. So it's peer review is the first stage of review at NIH, and therefore, I'll talk about that. So I am the scientific review officer or the SRO. I'm the designated federal officer that's going to be present. It's going to manage the whole peer review process. And what I mean by peer review process is I'm going to select reviewers and study chairs for the uh, 
to review your applications as well as conduct a meeting. Uh, I will manage conflicts of interest, ask reviewers to identify conflicts of interest. What are conflicts of interest? They can be thought of somebody that has a financial stake in the company that's submitting, somebody that is collaborating with somebody else and therefore can be viewed as, both can be viewed as party bias. Um, you can, uh, and very close competitors can also be viewed as, as people in conflict. So if people are in conflict, that means that they will not have access. If they're in conflict with your application, they will not have access to your application. They will not able, be able to view the application. And at the meeting, they will be put in a, in a conflict room, conflict virtual room, and they will not hear the discussion. So they will not have access to any discussion and review of your application. And they will not provide a final score of that application. So that's for conflicts of interest. Um, I will assign three reviewers to review your application. And before the meeting, I will train these reviewers in the review policy at NIH as well as the process. And in very similar to what I'm gonna cover to you now, like in the next few slides, um, make sure that I that every all the policies and and the fairness is apply is a uh, is appropriate during the dis uh, discussion. There's no bias. There's no. There's nothing that happens, and everything is on the up and up for the review meeting. And eventually, after that, all the applications will receive a summary statement. And the summary statement, will, which will be at least the three assigned reviewers critique. And if the application is discussed at the meeting, and I'll go further to explain what that means, you will also get a, a resume of the discussion. And all of this will be accessible by the uh, ERA Commons. And uh, you'll, you'll get that within 30 days of the review meeting. So next slide, please. So how do you select reviewers for, for the, the review of the application? Basically in general, for SBIR, STTRs, we, we're looking for people with scientific expertise, basically in the area. So looking specifically in the topic that we're talking about now, people that have experience with IDM, people that have experience with education, and people that have a mature judgment, a breadth of expertise. So don't think of it as the person that's going to be looking at your application is somebody that is the expert in the specific area you're thinking about, but write your application as though you, somebody might be parallel or in periphery to that expertise. So try to make it not too many, too much jargon and so on as looking for people with a breadth of expertise to review. People that are impartial, people that have, so have some commercialization expertise. So often for phase two or fast track, I'm gonna be looking for put somebody in as one of the assigned reviewers that has familiarity in, in commercializing an IDM product in the past. Uh, in general, we wanna have some small business uh, representation in these panels. Uh, at least one member, but often 25 to 50% of the panel, review panel will be small business. Next slide. So as uh, Tony said, there's a PAR that was issued and the, the one I'm talking about here. And if you look, if you look at the, uh, this PR 23.213, and you look at the section five, in, in, 
you will see exactly what the reviewers are looking for, what I will train them and ask them to look for in the app, in the applications and the critiques that they're gonna discuss. So this is kind of a, the next few slides are a summary of section five, and I'll try to highlight what's most important. Next slide. So basically, in terms of review criteria, we ask reviewers to look at five different criteria, which is in generically significance, investigators, innovation approach, and environment. And we ask them to score between one and nine for these five review criteria. It's a reverse scale. So one is exceptional and nine is four. And as well as giving an overall impact, uh, num numerical uh, score of an application. So overall, what do you think the overall impact is? And for the IDM, I always like to think of it as you want to see assess the likelihood that the application will exert a powerful hands-on inquiry-based and learning by doing experience. So, and this, so basically, the the assigned review will also score do a general score between one and nine, and that that overall score can be it can be weighed the different criteria scores in whichever way that the reviewer thinks is most pertinent also reviewers will look at human subjects and inclusion and tony will talk about human subject subjects next after my section and they also look at the adequacy of this application being a phase two a fast track or direct phase two. Next slide. So the criterion of significance that reviews will look at, they'll say, okay, if, if the project, if all the aims are successful, does this project solve an important problem or critical barrier to the field? So basically in, in by, providing a good good substance to have a good impact for significance you want to highlight really what's the status of the of the field presently and how will your application really uh, address some critical barrier to that field so in general for IDM you want to make sure that how will it uh, enhance whatever the user's knowledge of biomedical science? How will, will it enhance the interest of the, of the subject population in learning and in solving problems? So specifically now, because it's an SBIR, STTR, there's always the, uh, idea of commercial potential is always in the back of the mind. Uh, you wanna make sure that you will, within significance, the reviewers will ask, ascertain how will this project lead to a marketable STEM product? So you should be able to convey at least a vision of what would come out to be eventually a, a an impactful STEM product. So if you're talking about a phase one, it's only a feasibility at this point. So you won't have a full blown commercial plan, commercialization plan in your application to make that case. But even for phase one, you should spend a few lines just to tell the reviewers what you envision your product to be, this marketable STEM product that you're developing. What do you, how do you um, envision this product to be placed at and to where its impact should be? Next slide. 
So for commercialization plan, which is required if you have a phase two, a direct phase two or a fast track. So as Tony says, so I'll, that's a 12 page uh, section. So you wanna make sure here you get to uh, highlight what, what are the, uh, what's the market that you're targeting? What are the competitors that you see in that market? How will you address penetrating that market? How will you deal with maybe potential IP positions that other people have or that you might have? How, how will you show the demonstrated need? Basically, so a market is the demonstrated need for that market for your potential product. And how, how um, will your product contribute to the uh, overall uh, goals of your company in terms of long-term goals also to impact uh, education and so on. So here I, on that slide, I have a few more uh, language that might help you in writing commercialization plan. Next slide. Investigators are something reviewers will be looking at. And often in the bio sketch, they want to make sure that the the PI, the and everybody involved in the application have the relevant expertise. They have a track record if they don't. If you have patents, that's great. If you have publications, that's great. Anything that will reassure the, the uh, reviewers that you have the um, expertise and wherewithal to come to bring the project to fruition. If there's a multi-PI um, project, so then how, how will you integrate? How will you work collaboratively? Uh, how will it be governed? Who will, how will this, the structure of governance be set? Next slide. So innovation is the third criterion that people, that reviewers will look for. They wanna make sure that as the project is innovative, it, it employs novel concepts and approaches and methodologies, and the product is needed by the marketplace. That's in general how we state what's needed for SBIR, SCTR purposes. In, in this uh, PR, what's going to be very important is that you, you highlight that you're using technologies and education methodologies that, that are current and that will enhance the effectiveness of what you're trying to do. Is, um, and maybe, maybe how these methodologies might be first in class or break new grounds in applying IDM to pre-college education. Next slide. For the approach, uh, any SBIR, STTR needs to have clear milestones, no matter what phases the application is in. It also needs to have a rigorous approach and you, have, you need to highlight if there's potential possible pitfall, pitfalls that you've identified, then alternative approaches that you will consider. And of course, if, if there's human subjects involved, then uh, NIH is really strongly pushed that both sexes be considered. And if human subjects are, are involved also, the inclusion of um, women minorities 
uh, and if you end up excluding some groups, it should be justified. And then the reviewer will look at it and see if they agree with this justification. Other things to look at when, when looking at the approach, reviewers will make sure that um, the approach as the development plan has had sufficient early input from teachers and students. There's a sufficient plan to collect and incorporate user feedback. The product has to be interactive, as IDM says, interactive digital media. Products that has to be built on a technology platform that is actually accessible to the target group. And the, and the product has to be culturally appropriate. And the, the evaluation of its effectiveness, of the project effectiveness, the instruments that will be used for this evaluation and the metrics need to be appropriate as well. Next slide. The environment is the fifth criterion to be scored is more self-explanatory. You want to make sure that the environment maybe that that you the project will evolve in the um, the subject population is highlighted and appropriate. The collaborative arrangement is also something that is appropriate and and will contribute to the uh, the project. And anything else that is needed by the project is highlighted. Institutional support, equipment, or the resources, maybe even um, if you have agreements with the uh, with the uh, school systems and so on. Next slide. So here I'm gonna just look at, tell you a little bit about other things that people look at that reviewers will look at in the adequacy of a fast track, if that is the application format that they have in their hand. They're going to look, make sure that the application has two distinct phases. A phase one, which highlights proof of concept and or getting to feasibility. And then a phase two, which is a, a further R&D effort. And they will look at, make sure that the phase one to phase two transition will have a transition milestone that will have, be a go no go decisions because the, the go from the money of the phase one to the money of the, of the phase two program will not ask for this application to go back to review. They will just need something that says, okay, their phase one was successful. So therefore a transition metric that highlights that the phase one portion was successful would make it easy for for program to ascertain, okay, we can go ahead and give them money, the money for phase two. So that's that's what's important with fast track. Two phases and a transition milestone. For a phase two or a direct phase two, you want to make sure that in your application you've highlighted a successful completion of the phase one milestones or for direct phase two, something that is equivalent, something that has demonstrated feasibility. And again, the phase two and direct phase two will also need to have milestones and goals um, to write the phase two portion. Next slide. Yeah, again, just another. There's a couple icons that need to show up in this slide, so just keep keep adding. Yeah, and one more, one more. 
Yep, I guess one less. Go back. Sorry. Okay, so the overall impact scoring is basically um, the reviewers will have have scored five criteria. They will also come up with an overall impact score between one and nine. And the way we think of if the score is between one, two, and three, it's a high impact application. Medium impact is five, six, and uh, four, five, six, and low impact is seven, eight, and nine. You can think of a, a high impact application is uh, maybe an application that addresses an important problem, an important problem to the field, and it has very little weaknesses in the approach the the application, the investigators are stellar and so on. So that's when you think of a high impact application. You can think of a low impact application being either an application of high significance, but it has is peppered with so many major weaknesses in in different criteria that to bring the overall impact to a low range. Or it can also be an, an application of a low um, significance, basically a low impact to the field. And even though it might have very few weaknesses in the different criteria, it will also be scored in the low range. What the uh, people we usually ask the reviewers to start if they don't know anything about an application is start with a five being a good medium impact application score and let the strength of the application bring, in, bring them up to a higher impact score and the weaknesses the, bring them down to a lower impact score. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the scores are well distributed. There's a dynamic range to provide some, um, some differentiation for an IH to score the best application, to, to fund the best application. Next slide. Um, so what's the summary statement? All applications, all applicants will get a summary statement. And the summary statements will, will be at least the three, the critiques of the three assigned reviewers. And what will determine how an application is discussed during a uh, review meeting, it will it'll be discussed depending on usually it, typically a little more than the top half of the preliminary overall impact scores. The impact score that the reviewer gives, the top half and a little more will be discussed in the review meeting. And regardless of the fact that your application is discussed or not, you will get a summary statement. The overall impact score that you will see if your application is discussed, it'll be a basically an average of the final overall impact score of the entire panel. The entire review panel, except the people that are in conflict, will score the application, will give a final score to the application. And then um, in the average, multiplied by 10 will, will, um, will be the score you see. And uh, all summary statements will be released within 30 days of the review meeting. If you're a little more curious about how the uh, peer review system works at NIH and CSR, Center for Scientific Review, which is the center at NIH that that reviews pretty much about three quarters of the applications that NIH receives. Uh, 
you can just click on, on the blue link I have at the bottom of this slide. And I believe that the slide deck will be available to you uh, after the, uh, the, the webinar. And I'm sure Tony will highlight that. Next slide, I think I'm done at this point. Okay, MJ, thank you very much. So you can see that the, the review process at NIH is very organized. It's been evolving for a long time. And the nice thing about this particular review panel is that it's what's, what's called a special emphasis panel. So as MJ mentioned, the applications are received, they're sent to MJ, and she will sit down and go through them and look for the, the kind of scientific expertise is needed, the kind of business expertise that is needed, and then she will identify reviewers who are appropriate uh, with the peer review process. And I think this is uh, a great example of peer review because the uh, majority of the folks, maybe all of the folks on, on MJ's panel have been, have been successfully competing for STEM games or IDM games at the NIH. And you know they have companies. So, and the other thing about the peer review for the panel is many of these folks a year from now will not be on the panel, they will be applicants. So they really, you know, they've been in the trenches, they understand the issues of dealing with schools or whatever it happens to be. So I'm gonna launch into the next section, which is human subjects. Now, um, often people coming from a, a G, um, Department of Education, NSF, that has less of, well, just it's uh, human subject is an important factor with the NIH. And so the, the gaming applications or gaming projects almost always have participants. You're creating a device to train people in uh, respiratory therapy, or you, you're, you're creating a game or a device to uh, teach kids about organic chemistry or how the brain works. And so at some point, you're gonna have to create your device and then take it into the classroom or to a science fair and test it out. So next slide, please. So, you know, in, in the NIH also defines this as research. As I mentioned, this is an R mechanism type of a, a grant research mechanism. And so there's always some research involved in it. And I mentioned earlier that um, having good evaluation and having an evaluator um, help you draft your research proposal and having an evaluator who's uh, working with you on a day-to-day -day basis, not only to create the evaluation instruments, but also to interpret those data and so on. Um, we're, we're looking at this, as I mentioned, as a research activity. And so part of the innovation is tweaking uh, the current approach or the, uh, the norm of an approach to education and trying some new things. Because um, this particular program, and I think all SBR programs are like the VC. You know, they're, they're hoping that one project in 10 or 15 or 20, um, two or three years down the road, moves the field forward, and really advances how we learn uh, using gaming. And so um, you can see that research, uh, you're collecting data. And the second bullet is you're, you're working with individuals or groups. You're collecting information on focus groups or surveys and so on. Um, it's a little more difficult in a scenario like this because sometimes you're going to, say, an after school science club where it's hard to track the individuals. And some projects will work directly with uh, individuals, for example, training. And so they're gonna have a better, uh, a more, uh, a longer period of time interacting with these individuals. And so the, uh, well, how you collect those data and how you safeguard the, those data is important. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the claim for, the, the decision tree for whether or not it's a clinical trial, because um, you notice that the funding announcement has uh, no clinical trial allowed. For the omnibus, some, some of the uh, versions of the SBIR or SDTR require a clinical trial. So this is more for creating uh, medical devices for patient therapy or patient treatment. So as you go through this, the first, first step you take is do you have participants? The answer is yes, because you have uh, folks you're working with. And prospective assignment to an innovation, it could be yes or no. In other words, uh, you go into a classroom and you've got four third grade classes and you two of them have the intervention, two of them do not. Um, and the study is designed to evaluate the impact. Yes, you wanna find out whether this works or not. And sometimes you have the ability to look at long-term impact, sometimes just short-term impact, but nonetheless, um, if it's designed as a, 
um, to augment standard teaching on neuroscience or um, data or math, then you're gonna have to have some evaluation outcomes. Number four is key because it's, you're not looking for a health or behavior outcome. However, we, this is a kind of a gray area because we've, this program has funded projects, for example, one called Dusty the Dragon that exposes middle school kids to what smoking is all about, the chemical component, the, the biological impact. So it, it is uh, looking for a, a behavioral change, but it's not a behavioral change in terms of a clinical trial. Next slide, please. So this is an important component, whether or not the project is exempt. And so basically um, most of the projects like this are in the exempt category. So they could be uh, what's called an X1 or category one or two. So they're basically collecting uh, information in a classroom setting. Um, you can see the second bullet under the X1, um, oral health delivered. Um, the X2 is usually outside of a formal um, classroom basis. But this is a case where, you know, if you have, a, if you have concern, there's a lot of decision trees and, and uh, links you can go to, or you can uh, contact me. And I'll bring this up now is, um, I talked about it earlier that uh, MJ is the person to contact about grant related issues. So if, for example, you want to include a video of some device you've created, there's two parts of this. One is to contact MJ and uh, discuss what you want to bring in and she, she will make the decision whether it's appropriate or not. And the second is if you wanna submit something, you have to have this in the cover letter. And the cover letter is something that you can Google NIGMS cover letter. It's a very nice uh, discussion about the benefits of submitting a cover letter. But nonetheless, um, if you have questions about the human subjects, send, send me an email. And uh, the caveat is this is the busy time of year. Uh, we do about two thirds of our work in the last third of the year. So I always tell folks, email early in the morning to set up a call. And if you don't hear back by lunchtime, just resend it. And I won't speak for MJ and Brian, but um, it's important that you, uh, or it's helpful if you have the right human subjects components. Next slide, please. There's several things you need to have um, in your proposal. It's under the human subjects. One is the protection of human subjects. So it just, it, it's basically informed consent and it's a risk to benefits and the benefit uh, of the intervention. And you can find the instructions for this by Googling it. The other is the inclusion of women, minority and children. Now MJ, uh, discuss this in her session, but the NIH basically has a level playing field. And so if you're proposing to get taxpayer dollars to conduct research, um, you need to include everyone. Well, obviously certain things, uh, um, breast cancer is, it's a different target audience than the general public. But um, you need to have a plan for the inclusion of women, minority, and children, unless you have a specific justification that that's not the case. And then there's something else that's in, important you know, it's called the Inclusion and Enrollment Report. And this is basically a spreadsheet that goes into the human subject section. And it's your best guess as to how many people in terms of gender, race, ethnicity that you're gonna have. Again, this is just your best guess. Um, there's lots of uh, links. You, know, you still have questions about it. Send me an email. Next slide, please. Okay, helpful links. Now there's lots of information out there. Um, and for almost for every topic, there's an FAQ. And so these are great places to go. If you can't find what you're looking for, then uh, send me an email. Now, one of the things that's come up over the last uh, uh, several cycles uh, is the concept of an RCT, a randomized controlled trial. Unfortunately, the terminology is, is a little vague or fuzzy because there's also a randomized clinical trial both with the same acronym, but a randomized controlled trial, it's just it. It's you're randomizing your test subjects so that you're not uh, dividing up say classrooms into groups that may have a different uh, um, academic potential, something like that. So um, these are all important uh, terminologies and important components of the application. Next slide, please. Okay, I turn it over to Brian. He'll talk about everything you wanna know about grants management and what you can and, can and cannot uh, include into your proposal. Thank you, Tony. Um, 
Again, my name is Brian Iglesias. I'm a grants management specialist here, and I primarily look at the administrative and budgetary aspects of your proposal. Um, so we can uh, talk about a couple of things that you that we see and a couple of things about the budget that you should be aware of. Next slide or first slide, please. Thank you. Um, as has been mentioned, these are part of the SBIR um, program. So there are limits on what you can request on these. Uh, and as been stated in the notice in the notice of funding announcement and elsewhere in this uh, presentation, the phase one can be up to $295,000 and the phase two can be 1.9 million. Um, these guys, these are the uh, caps that, that are published out there. They can be exceeded with a waiver. NIH has published a list of um, special topic waivers that if your project does fit within one of those uh, waiver topics, um, you could exceed this amount up to a certain amount. Um, if you think you're going to exceed these, then it is highly recommended you reach out to uh, to Tony to make sure that your uh, your proposal does fit one of these waivers because you don't want to send something in that's above these waiver uh, these, these limits, and then they don't fit into a waiver because um, we won't be able to approve that higher amount. Um, so if you have any, uh, if you do think you're going to, you may need to exceed it, and of course in all of these cases you're going to your your proposal needs to be reasonable and it needs to be justified on, on the amount that you're requesting. Um, and another quick note on these, these, these numbers are in the, no, in the notice of funding announcement. They do change annually though. Um, these are what they are now. I don't expect them to change for the, you know, for the next receipt uh, date. But you know, if you come in to, in the future, make sure you're checking to make sure that these numbers haven't increased because you don't you don't want to miss out on that if they do go up because they usually do go up annually. Um, again, one of the uh, requirements for an SBIR, a small business grant, is that the PI's primary employment must be with the small business. If you have multiple, if it's a multiple um, program uh, principal investigator proposal, then at least one of the PIs must meet the requirements. So one of them must be primarily employed by the small business. Um, the award project period for phase one are six months. It can be up to a year. You just need to justify why you need more than six months because six months is the uh, guideline. And a phase two can be up to two years. That's usually uh, MOTIR funded, okay? Um, a quick note on indirect costs. Um, indirect costs for your organizations, they can be reimbursed up to 40% of modified total direct costs without a negotiated rate agreement. Um, that's important to know it's, um, because uh, a lot of times NIH will, well, NIH will not negotiate a rate agreement for a phase one. Um, and the reason for that is because the uh, phase ones are pretty, you know, six months to a year and it can take, you know, it could take up to six months to actually do a negotiation. So by the time the negotiation is done, the award is done. Um, so if you don't have a rate, um, you can request up to 40% of your modified total direct cost for the grant without a rate. Um, for a phase two, these are much bigger awards. They're longer, they have a longer time span. <clears throat> if, you, if you do not have a rate, NIH will start negotiating a rate with you for a, for a phase two. Um, however, keep in mind that it could take just as long. It could take months down the line. And while we may award you the, the FNA that you request on it, the, the rate that you propose, we wouldn't be able to re release those funds for you to expend until that rate agreement is, uh, is finalized and that could take months. Um, so if you have any questions on that, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me and we can tackle over some scenarios. <clears throat> um, one of the other um, very important requirements of a SBAR is the third party. Um, third party costs are, are capped at a, a maximum of 33% for a phase one and a phase two. This isn't just sub awards though, this is basically any cost that is not the small business. So consultants, fee for service uh, contracts, sub awards, consortiums, things like that, all have to fit within these uh, these guidelines. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, one other thing, I, uh, this is mostly for phase twos that are multi-year. Uh, uh, so competing applications with a detailed budget, you can continue to request cost of living, inflationary increases. Um, in, in accordance with your organizational policy. However, um, please be aware that NIH has a policy of not awarding those. So we can tell you not to request it, but we will not, we, we have not paid uh, COLAs, um, 
inflationary increases in about 10 years. So if we see that, we do have to scale it back and keep it flat to the, to the first year. So my recommendation is to always um, keep your cost flat um, because you don't want to lose out on that. And you can put that money into somewhere else. Um, and that's what the next uh, bullet is. So, <clears throat> or the second, the third one. Um, you can't, that doesn't mean that your budget has to be flat year to year, that you can't increase it. If you have additional personnel or someone's going from 50% effort to 70% effort in the, in the second year, um, those are warranted and you can request that. But increases strictly for COLA, the inflationary stuff, um, NIH does not uh, award, um, but we can tell you not to request it. So if you're, it's your policy to request it, just know that you probably won't be getting that increase in. <clears throat> and there's a useful link here that you can get when we send out the slides that talks about that. Um, and of course, again, give me a call or send me a text if you have any questions. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, and I wanted to talk a little about, about personnel costs, the kind of costs, actually um, a lot of costs, a lot of the costs that we see in the application. Um, individuals designing, directing, and implementing the research education program, you can request salary, fringe, anything that's appropriate to the person once that you're devoting to that program. Um, you, you can't, the salaries have to, uh, may not exceed levels commensurate with the institution's policy uh, for similar positions and may not exceed the congressional mandated cap. So uh, right now, NIH has a cap, a salary cap, it's about 212,000. Um, you can't request the proportion of that for any personnel. Um, if you do, we would have to reduce that budget. So that's just something to keep aware of. That actually does go up every year as well. <clears throat> and uh, one thing we see a lot are, are requests for mentoring in some of these projects. Um, however, note that if mentoring are considered a part of the individual's regular academic duties, then you can't request it separately as a separate salary or consulting cost on the grant. Um, next, what, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> participants, I want to talk a little about participant costs because these, these types of awards do have participants usually designing a program for someone or something. And um, participants are, the one, are those individuals who are involved in the research education activity. You can, be, you can pay participant costs um, if they are specifically required for the proposed research education program. And you do need to itemize them. You pretty much need to itemize everything in the budget, but especially these types of costs. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, one thing uh, that we see a lot on these types of awards are meals, food, things like that. Um, and they are allowable for subjects and patients under the study. Um, if, you're, if they're specifically approved as part of the project activity. Um, they cannot be duplicated in a per diem or subsistence allowances. And when certain meals are integral and necessary part of the meeting or conference, um, grant funds can be used to provide food and meals for that. Now, <clears throat> recurring business meetings such as staff meetings, those don't count um, as, um, as, as ongoing per, uh, project activities. So if they're regularly scheduled, then they, they cannot be used for, uh, grant funds cannot be used for those types of meals. And there's a link to the grants policy statement in there, um, which I recommend you guys take a look at. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And so um, one thing that <clears throat> should be guiding everything, every cost that is in your budget is that they are reasonable, allocable, necessary, and consistently treated. A couple of those big things are that they are allocable, that we can directly attribute that cost to the project that you're doing. Um, and the other thing is that they're consistently treated, no matter where the money is coming from. So if you were going to, let's say, have a conference and you were going to um, cater it, because it, and it would normally be allowable, it doesn't matter where that money is coming from. If it was coming from you know, your, your organization or from the grant, you can't increase that cost only because it's coming from the grant, okay? And uh, you do want to provide ad adequate budget justifications um, to all the costs that you're proposing. So I would expand on that budget justification. Uh, make sure that you are including all the costs that you're requesting in there. And uh, you can actually research uh, proposed costs in advance in the NIH grants policy statement. 
Um, there's a big section on there on what's allowable, what's not allowable. And you can also use me as a resource as well. Uh, next, next slide, please. <laughs> Um, other program-related expenses can be consultants, equipment, supplies, uh, travel for key persons, and um, they, all that kind of stuff can be requested in the budget. They are allowable. They just need to be justified, and they need to be directly attributable to the project that you're doing. Next slide, please. And a quick, uh, just a quick overview of some of the things we see on these particular types of grants and some things that are allowable and not allowable. Um, teachers and students participating in a project can be compensated for their participation in the project. Incentive payments to volunteers or participants in a grant-supported project are allowable. So you can give, you know, incentives as gift cards, things like that, um, as long as they are for them doing something that is project-related. Um, allowable, unallowable costs <clears throat> that we see on, on these types of grants are stipends. They are not allowable on research grants. Now, this is one thing to keep in mind. This might be a terminology. Um, stipends to NIH are defined as subsistence allowances where there's, the person is not doing something for the grant. Um, there are separate types of awards that are not SBIRs that stipends are allowable on. Um, but so what you need to keep in mind is that you can compensate someone as long as they're doing something for the grant. Um, you may call it a stipend, but if they're actually doing something that is for the grant because they're on the grant, then that is allowable. Um, so if you, so that might be a terminology issue that we see a lot. If you have any uh, questions on if something you want to do might be considered an actual stipend if NIH defines a stipend versus what you just find a stipend, um, just you know you can shoot me an email. We can talk about it and um, come to a consensus. Um, entertainment is not allowable on NIH awards. Um, that goes back a little bit to the meals policy. Meals can be considered entertainment, but again, as long as that um, conference or meeting is to disseminate or talk about information that is pertinent to the award, then it is allowable. Um, gifts are unallowable on NIH awards. Uh, and again, that kind of ties into the incentive payments where you know, giving someone a gift card to do a study or to do a survey <clears throat> is not a gift as it's defined by NIH, um, but it is an incentive, so that would be allowable. And promotional items are not allowable on NIH awards as well. Um, so next slide, please. Mm. Uh, honorariums, we see this one a lot. Honorariums, as NIH defines it, are when you are paying someone to confer distinction uh, on a speaker. Now, if you have a guest speaker or you have a speaker come in to talk to a conference and they're talking to, some, to a group about this grant, that is not an honorarium as NIH defines it. So again, it comes back to a little bit of terminology and what, how NIH defines an honorarium and how an organization may define it. So again, if you have any questions on something that you want to uh, include in your budget, and you're not sure if it fits our definition or your definition, shoot us a text, shoot me a text and uh, uh, email and we can, uh, we can discuss it. Um, General supplies, they're usually, general supplies are usually not uh, allowable on a grant. Um, they're usually part of an f and uh, They're usually not at the direct cost. But if you need a notebook or you need a computer or you need a file cabinet that is directly allocable to the, to the project that you're doing, um, then it could be allowable. Just make sure that you are justifying it in the, in the grant application. Um, because usually general supplies are uh, indirect expense. Uh, that an organization will, you know, buy a set of, you know, 200 notebooks for, for, you know, for the company. That wouldn't be allowable. But if you're buying things that are directly allocable to the project that you need specifically for it, then that is allowable. Just again, make sure you justify it. Um, and next slide, please. Um, oh, and uh, that was that was a lot of the uh, that was a lot of the issues that we see on some of these. And I think the big takeaway is if you have any questions on if a cost is uh, allowable, then uh, please shoot me a message and we can discuss uh, beforehand. And I'll turn it back to Tony. Thank you very much, Brian. I always learn so much listening to the, <clears throat> the budget side of things. So what we're going to do now is, is go inside a panel, kind of be a fly on the wall, because uh, many people who have not 
prior, uh, say that have no prior experience submitting to the NIH. It's, it's kind of this mystery. So in general, as, as we mentioned earlier, the grant applications, you know, you talk to myself and, and MJ and Brian, get the information, you sub submit the grant, it goes to the Center for Scientific Review, and then because it's set specifically for this notification funding announcement, the NOFO, the IDM, <coughs> excuse me, it goes to MJ. MJ then sits down, goes through the content, identifies the reviewers, and they get, <coughs> oh, I, you know, four to six weeks to write the reviews. And once they've com committed the review, they submit it, they can see what the other reviewers state. And then the day of the meeting, which uh, used to be face to face, now it's a Zoom meeting, um, the reviewers are there. And as MJ mentioned, about half the applications are discussed because we'll never be able to fund them all. And so it doesn't make any sense for the reviewers to spend twice as long discussing applications that are just need to be re resubmitted to have the rough edges polished up. But when an application comes up for review, the chair will identify the grant number identify the applicant, and then identify the three assigned reviewers. So the first thing happens, the reviewers give their initial level of enthusiasm, which is usually between one and about five or six, sometimes it's seven. Remember one is perfect and six or seven is less than perfect. So each reviewer gives their scores and sometimes it's a 333 or a 666 and sometimes it's a 127. I mean, they don't really always have consensus. Then the lead reviewer, reviewer number one, will give an overview of the project, um, two or three minutes, just so everyone in the room gets a gist of what's going on. But to be quite, and the reviewers don't have to re review or read all of the applications, only those they're assigned to. But to be quite honest, I'm sure that uh, reviewers who are not assigned to a, a game for early learners or uh, training on, on cardiovascular sonography uh, they're going to read it anyway. They're curious about the content and they want to be actively engaged in the discussion. So the lead reviewer gives an overview. Um, the other two reviewers give their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, you know, but if they disagree with the lead reviewer, they can disagree, but they don't repeat it. And then the the reviewer, um, the the group has a discussion. And if they if they have the two, three, seven, uh, they're supposed to negotiate towards the middle. They they don't always do it, but you know the other. Uh, usually, there's about 15 or so reviewers, so everybody gets to be engaged in the conversation. And if there's consensus, the review, the discussion maybe takes five, 10 minutes. If there's less, if there isn't any consensus, it might take 15, 20 minutes. But then um, the chair, and MJ is the the overall judge and jury. She runs it, but there's a chair who. Um, does the manipulations and discussion control, but then they have the final level of enthusiasm. So um, as I mentioned, what started off as a 333 might end up as a 333 or a 444, but uh, those being the scores of the three assigned reviewers, but then if it's a 237, uh, one would hope it's a 456, but that doesn't always happen. And then if, if there's a uh, lack of consensus, that's when the chair looks out to the end of the screen, I, I'm sorry, and just tells the other folks to vote their conscience. And so if the, the outs, outlier has great arguments, then they might probably vote that way. But bottom line is this is how the review process works. So next slide. So MJ went through this. So one to three is really, really good stuff, a few, few rough edges, four to six is intermediate, and seven to nine is generally not discussed because it's, it's just the topic or the, the grantsmanship is just not appropriate. And um, for this uh, funding announcement, it no longer allows resubmissions. So if you receive a score outside the pay line, you're just encouraged to resubmit. You can use the reviewer criteria or the re reviewer comments. Those are your consultants tell you what was good and bad, and you come back in with another application. And it's always good to make sure the title is very different. Next slide. Uh, MJ talked about the five bullets. I won't go through them. But this is, uh, these are the general areas of uh, discussion. But to be quite it's, it's very much like a Zen diagram. There's a lot of overlap between something like significance and innovation and so on. Next slide, please. So MJ went through this. I won't uh, be legal, but significance, uh, you really want to convince the, the panel that 
you know what you're talking about. You've done your homework. Uh, if you're bringing a, a product to market that's packed with other products like it, you know you have to make make sure the reviewers under know that you know who the competition is and that you know your product is either much cheaper and just as good or much better and not too more much more expensive. The investigators they want to see the track record, publications, evaluation. If you have a prior, uh, if you've been doing this for a while or even have a pilot and have publications or outcomes data, shamelessly market that. You know, you, you wanna go into this with the phase, particularly the phase one is not uh, cocky, but confidence. You know, you've, you've been doing this for a while or you have a great product and a good team. Um, you're looking at the phase one as a slam dunk. You're already looking forward to the phase two. Uh, the innovation, um, your customer base, customer base, even if they're elementary school kids are pretty critical of outdated technology and, and concepts. Next slide, please. So the approach. So I always tell people, this is the research plan. So um, with the phase one, it's six pages. The phase two, you got 12 pages for the research plan and 12 pages for commercialization. You wanna make it really easy to follow, for the reviewers to follow what you're doing. So I say, tell people no more than three specific aims and be very, very organized. Aim 1.1, 1.2. Uh, aim two and three, maybe a 3.1, sometimes a 3.1 lowercase a, but you wanna have GPS waypoints so that if in aim one, you're talking about how you're gonna recruit the, you know, who your target audience is, and you can state that in aim 3.2, we'll tell you about how we're gonna go find them. So they don't have to uh, spend a lot of time moving around. Uh, MJ mentioned this, you need to have uh, discussed the problems and solution and pitfalls. Um, if you have an internal evaluator or you're getting external, you know, have them help you draft the research plan because trying to going out and finding an evaluator after you got the money that not only understands the, the content, but maybe the target audience or the, the technology is, is different. And again, a needs assessment, you know, teachers, whoever your target audience is, you want to make sure that they need a product that you're trying to, to put in there. Um, Disregard the logic model, but uh, a Gantt chart is critical, a detailed time and events, who's gonna do what, because um, that really helps the reviewers. And then literature documentation. So anytime you make a statement, even if it's obvious, uh, if you take, if, if the elementary school kids have a science day and they have a good time, the next time the teacher says, um, let's have a science day, they go, yay. Or uh, a statement that, um, you know, if elementary school kids, uh, are exposed to math and numeracy early on, it's good for their, their educational careers. Well, that's well documented. So use current literature to back up your statements. Never really have a blank statement just because it sounds good. Next slide. Okay, control groups. This is always difficult with the phase one. It's proof of principle six, six months to a year. So you just do the best you can. Um, NGSS alignment. Uh, this is for the stem the education component of this, not necessarily for the training component, but next generation science standards. Often the only way you can get into a classroom is if you uh, have a product aligned with NGSS that's gonna be better, or at least you're gonna test to see that it's a better, has a better impact on the students than the books or the standard. Uh, put tables, figures, charts in there, because with six pages, a couple tables and figures can really convey a lot of information and save you save you uh, text because the good news about six pages is only six pages. The bad news, it's hard to get detail in there. One of the, the primary overall uh, review weaknesses is not enough detail. Images, put images in there. A couple of years ago, one of the reviewers said, you know, they had an image of their, their widget and it was a great picture. So not only did I, I know that they could do it because it was such a cool picture, but I didn't have to fantasize about what it was. So images are good. Letters of support. These are important, and they're really two groups. One would be the your know, corporate folks, or you know, consultants, and uh, the non-school people. People who are going to you've worked, and if you've worked with them in the past, that's great because they can send send a letter saying, you know, we've enjoyed working with you. The last project was dynamite. So if you we're hoping you get this award, and if you do, we're ready to jump in. And the other would be for the the gatekeepers, the people at the schools who give you access to the teachers and students, or vice versa. And I talked about the literature documentation. Next slide. Okay, the environment. So institutional commitment. Um, 
an educational environment for the participants, and then, you know, buy-in from your stakeholders. And this is this would be really highlighted in the letters of support. Next slide. Okay, what I did was go back for about three or four years of summary statements. I took, <clears throat> remember the five bullets, and I looked at the strengths for the really strong applications, the ones that were funded. <clears throat> and I looked at the weaknesses for the ones that were got the ND, not discussed. And so strengths in the significance. Well, organized, the scientific promises, <clears throat> excuse me, the premise is sound. Uh, it's got pedagogy, it's hypothesis driven. If we expose students to this, uh, it will improve the following. And then again, shamelessly market your successes, both for the team and, and the key personnel. Next slide. Weaknesses on the literature references. Um, you've been doing something, you know, you've had this platform for five years and you have really no evidence that you've sold anything or you have any impact or publications. And again, the NGSS, because sometimes that really is your ability to take your product into the schools. And in some cases, um, this is where your, your target audience, uh, your test audience is important because sometimes you have access to the local schools, but the demographics in um, Birmingham <clears throat> and Nashville are very different from the demographics in Seattle and Portland. So you have to make sure that when you're doing your, your phase one testing, that the test audience has some relevance or appropriateness to your eventual target audience. Next slide. Innovation, okay, strength. Uh, you're building on what you've done before, real world examples. So for example, projects that uh, say citizen science projects are much more popular if the, the testing or the product is looking at uh, something that's impacting the community that has an impact on their health because then they have a vested interest in it working. Um, this, this other slide I loved, it was a reviewer last year and it was a multi PI team. So there were three key P key personnel and the reviewer said it was kind of weird, but it looks like each of the three PIs drafted one of the specific aims, but they never spoke to each other about how aim one linked aim two. So it needs to be a nice story. Next slide. Um, again, this is the, the whole market theory. You know, why is your product any different than what's out there? And then flexibility. So, um, you know, if it's, if it's has a very narrow target audience or market, then it's probably not going to do well. And the reviewers remember they they've had, they face the same dilemma. So you need to convince them that what you're, you're proposing, um, if you can make it happen, it's going to be very successful. Next slide. Okay, approach. So this is a research plan. So these are things you want to see. Clearly written, specific aims are articulated, try dealing with NGSS or state, and sometimes NGSS is not used with state science standards. And then needs assessment, feedback is utilized. And then if you can do the comparison group, but remember finding a perfect control group is very difficult, even if you're in your phase two. Next slide. Okay, this is a killer, this first bullet. So remember that the reviewer number one will present to the entire panel um, the overview of the product. And if the re lead reviewer starts off by saying, this is a great idea. I mean, it's gonna fit really nicely in the, pro in the market. It's got a great team, but the research plan is overly ambitious. I'm sure we have, and I spent, as I mentioned, I was in biotech and, you know, a couple of the companies, the management just tried to fix everything and they didn't focus on their core strengths. So uh, you wanna make sure you're gonna look at a very narrow target. But if there's a potential for your product once it's developed and out in the market to be tweaked for different audience or different content, you know, drop that in there because you know, that's the way you wanna do it. You don't wanna reinvent the wheel each time. Uh, the goals are not articulated. The assessment tools are non-existent or not validated. So you really need to have validated assessment tools um, in general, uh, the control group used, and then this testing group. If it, you really, it's difficult sometimes, but you really need to make sure you, you know, the, the group that you take it out for testing has something to do with your ultimate market. Next slide. Okay, this is really the, the bottom line. 
So you really want that um, that lead reviewer to stand up and say this is this is nice because these are folks who are working five, six, seven days a week, and they're not going to read this on a Monday morning with fresh coffee. It's going to be at the end of a long day, and what you want is for them to be able to spend at most 10 minutes. They look at your abstract, they look at your Gantt chart, they look at your team, they give a nice overview of the research plan. And in 10 minutes, they say, wow, really cool idea. I can see how it fits in the marketplace. They got a great team. I mean, these people have done it. They have a track record and I can understand the plan. So they're going into the deep dive, the deep uh, analysis of the proposal for their summary statement, but they're feeling good about it already. Um, and so next slide. Uh, this guy would have been a great grant writer. This is what you want to do. So if you have time, and you know we're running out of time, but I always tell folks, get it, get it done. Don't let, don't look at the application for a week or so. Go back and look at it again because you'll find some things that don't make sense. And then when you have that second polishing, so you can track down somebody who's been successful writing NIH grants, SBIRs in particular, and if they've been on a study section, that's even better. Give it to them. If they come back in a couple of days, say, I like this. You've got a good team, but I got lost in that transition from AIM-1 to AIM-2. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're open for questions. Um, and if you have, if you email me, we will send you the, the PowerPoint. Um, it's going to be a few weeks before it's available as a video. Um, as mentioned earlier, if you have questions about specific components, you know, send it off to one of us. And if it's a, a question in kind of a gray zone where we really don't have a yes or no, uh, we'll share it, but we'll get back to you. And as I mentioned earlier, if you send it and we don't get back in half a day, just resend it. So thanks again. And I turn it over to our, our host for uh, questions. Thank you, Tony. Uh, if anybody in the, excuse me, if anybody in the audience has any questions, please place your questions in the Q&A section. I know it was a little confusing there, but we did send out uh, confirmation that the chat is not is not there, but rather the Q&A. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. At this point, I don't see any questions, but we'll give you some time. You may be formulating them at the, as we speak. Okay, here, here's a, a question. Um, can I submit more than one application to a given funding announcement? So for example, uh, our company is, is we got 50 people and we've got a couple different target areas. You know, can we um, submit two applications to the same study section, say, say to this uh, funding announcement? The answer is yes. I mean, the NIH for most programs allows you to submit more than one application as long as they're scientifically distinct. Uh, on the other hand, um, if the review panel sees two applications from the same individuals and at, a, at a, a brief glance, they look like they're just a cut and paste of the previous one, it may not um, be viewed as well. MJ, do you have a, a comment on that? No, I think I think the um, the the applications have to be distinct. Uh, and I will if there's to a point where the overlap is, overlap is strong and is similar application that is not allowed. If they have distinct applications, then that's allowed. Okay, if thank uh, you. and the other the other thing which is more related to they all all the IDMs are going to come to one panel. If you end up submitting. Uh, same application with just just a slight tweak. You can just imagine as a reviewer, the reviewers will get mad having to review very similar things. And so that's just from from experience. So but NIH only allows distinct applications that that's it. Thank you, Tony. We, Tony, we got some questions coming in from the audience. Okay. The, the first question comes from Gus, who asks, what is the standard budget distribution between the company and academia? Okay, the, this is an interesting question because uh, I think the NIH is deliberately vague on this. Uh, in general, 
um, in the application, there's a budget section and there's a the kind of the first, um, the list of participants and it could be the key personnel. And this is generally the, the, the senior scientists. And then often there's other, ind other individuals who support staff or programmers or graphic artists and so on. Uh, in general, the majority of the budget is for salaries. Um, this is not always the case, but uh, and often it's 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 more brain power than than uh, creating something with a three D imager. But I'll turn the this this uh, subcontract question over to Brian. This is his area of expertise. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Like uh, Tony said, uh, personnel costs are usually the preponderance of the budgets that we see. It's it's the most expensive thing uh, on the budgets that we see. As for the distribution, it really just depends on what the plan is, what the research plan is. Um, you know, I, I've seen the SBR program in particular has those guidelines of how much uh, the most that can go to a third party because the goal of an SBIR of the SBIR program is to support the small business, not the research universities, academia. Um, so we usually do them pretty close to those. To those limits that we that, that we mentioned, like 33%, 50%. We don't usually see them um, much more than that. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Brian. John in our audience asked the following: What percentage of approved grants have succeeded in commercialization? And those who were successful, did most of uh, did most keep their plan or pivot? Okay. Um, you know, the answer to the first question, I think it's 90% of all startups fail within the first 10 years or something like that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, a lot of it is just the, um, the, the timing, the product, the, the staff. I mean, there's a lot of variables. Um, and in terms of the um, success of companies. So one of the things that I think is nice about this particular program is that, as I mentioned, the the SBIR percentage of an entity, whether it's the uh, Department of Defense or NIH or NIGMS, is 3.45 percent. I can't remember what the number is, but the and this is nice because GM has it's the third largest institute, and so the the checkbook each year for SBIRs at NIGMS is about 100 million dollars, and so that means our pay line, and the pay line is is nothing more than uh, when the grant application, when the summary statement goes out, um, you know, a, a really strong score would be 15, 19, 20, 25. And a very poor score would be, you know, something still discussed would be in the, say, the 50s. And so the, in general, the GM pay line uh, is is normally about twice, twice as high. So if it was X at, at a small institute that has a small budget, say a few hundred million versus uh, several billion, then the pay line is much higher. So that's very successful. Now, in terms of the, the success of companies down the road, um, you know, here's one example of a company that uh, it's just got a great product. It's targeting uh, middle school kids. It's, it's basic science and uh, medicine. The, the applicant in their first, their phase one got a 10, a perfect score. I'd never seen one before. They had a product out before the phase one was finished and they then went to a phase two and they have commercial products now. Um, they submitted another, I think this time a fast track. And so they are um, moving into the second phase of their fast track. So it's just some companies just have all those magic components. Um, We've had several companies had some really cool ideas and it just, it never um, came to fruition. So um, I think that, you know, going to a, a um, uh, say a STEM games uh, conference, like the games for us had just finished or Sue Bowley has her uh, serious play, uh, talking to people there and seeing what things, what's going on. So it's, it's a difficult question to ask. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like anything in the entrepreneurship world, uh, start early, uh, start young, and expect to fail a few times. <laughs> Thank you for the question. And Tony, for our next 
uh, question comes from Anonymous. They ask, with regard to diversity, are we aiming for a distribution of gender and other minorities that is representative of the target audience or something more like quotas for different groups for equity? Well, equity is nice, but, you know, in, and it's, I think it's the social justice is creeping into the, the field of medicine and business and so on. Um, but for gaming, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the NIH has a requirement for uh, equal representation of women, minority, and children, unless you can justify it. Uh, it's kind of a gray zone here because, um, you know, you're not working with a specific audience. Um, for the example, the SEPA program has a encouragement, or it's always been around to provide resources for communities where um, you know, going to college or even graduating from high school has never really been on the radar. So it, it gives these kids the opportunity and it addresses the concept called lost Einsteins, where it came out of Seattle a few years ago, actually maybe 10 years, but you know, it's basically, there's a lot of talent out there and a lot of potential, but the opportunities aren't always there. So um, it depends on the, Type of product you're you're providing, and you know if you want to if you design a product for a specific audience, then you need to justify it. We have a number of projects that um, target English language learners, and so they have the standard kind of approach to STEM education, but then they also have these options or the ability for uh, non-native English speakers to click on an icon and and find different words or define it. So it, it depends on your target audience. You just need to be as fair as you can. And I think that's a good business model, but you need to be as fair as you can within the confines of what you're proposing to do. Not, not, the, not a definite, definitive answer, but I think that's the best approach to it. And this is a case where uh, I really encourage folks to, if you wanna chat about your potential project, whether for this submission or, or another, um, just send an email. Everybody gets 30 minutes. And if we can't fix, finish the discussion in 30 minutes, you can schedule another 30 minutes. Thanks, Tony. Uh, another question from Gus is, does the product need to be launched in the K-1 to 12 classwork, or could it be a product, such as a learning game, for example, that can be launched widely without necessary being adopted in the traditional K-1 to 12 coursework? That's a, that's a good question. It's, it shows the evolution of this, this program. So about 10 years ago, I realized the SEPA program, which is a pre-K to grade 12, had several really nice VR programs on how the brain worked, plant physiology, organic chemistry. And so um, I did a little reading on it because back then I thought games were just blowing up aliens. And I realized this is, this is how kids learn. And one of the research articles, the punchline was if you look at the pedagogy, pedagogical, or they say the STEM knowledge content and pedagogical skills of great teachers, it's the same as great game designers. And so it started off with a focus on basically game, gamification of SEPA, but uh, pretty much anything is, is, is fair game. We have one project that's in its completed phase two, it's using VR to address the emotional issues for high school kids coming off drug addiction. Smart group, because even in their phase one, they hooked up with an HMO and now they have two HMOs who are uh, eager to get this product out. The HMO is gonna pay for it because it's cheaper for them to uh, prevent further problems or uh, speed up recovery than to deal with the, the opposite. And so um, we have a VR for, for training pulmonary therapists. So it's, it's, using, it's using VR or STEM technology for pretty much any area of uh, health and medicine. And that's also a gray zone because 15 years ago, NSF and NIH, we had a laser-like line in the sand. They dealt with hard science and we dealt with medicine and now it's very gray. And so, as I mentioned, we funded a great project using VR to teach kids organic chemistry. Not because orbitals are cool, but this is, this is if you tweak the orbitals and ring structures, this is how you make a compound that's not a very good drug, a good drug. So it's, 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 it's a, it's, it makes the program fun because the subject matter is so broad and diverse. Thanks, Tony. Uh, another, uh, we have a question from Gaurav, and I, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. And uh, they ask, are formal letters of collaboration 
as against letters of encouragement slash support from potential partner, partnering institutions absolutely required for a successful phase one proposal? I'm gonna briefly talk about this and then I'll let MJ, this is more her area. Well, I think it's, a, it's an overlapping area. So letters of support are important. So I've seen some projects go down in flames because it's a great project, great team. And they say, well, you know, we're gonna go to eight high schools in the city. And they never name the high schools in the research plan and there's no letters of support. So they're basically saying, give us some money and trust us to do what we said. Um, it's also the opportunity when you get these letters of support um, that if you've worked with these entities before, it gives the reviewers confidence that, you know, they've been in this business for a while. They know how to manage the success, a successful um, collaboration. And so we have, we have this trust. Or it could be somebody that you've spoken to. Maybe you meet somebody at a, at a conference and they come to your poster, they come to your table and you start talking and realize that this could be a, either a, a potential um, way to sp sp uh, split off some new technology or new games, or it could be uh, our access to new technology that fits ours, or it could be uh, it gives us a new audience. And so these letters are very important because it gives you credibility. Now, um, a couple of questions that sometimes come up. One is about the, the key people. Uh, we have this concept called a multi-PI team, which means you have more than you know, typically or historically NIH grants have a PI, principal investigator, who's the contact individual. And about 15 years ago, maybe longer, NIH came up with the MPI plans. It's more like a management team. And this is often good because um, these projects are, are often complex in terms of management and decision-making. And so with an MPI management team, you have to put or submit an MPI, um, how you're going to deal with decisions and, and conflicts and so on. But it, it gives your project credibility. Now, I turn over to MJ in terms of the letters of you know, that question that we, you raised. Um, there's no requirements, but uh, I can tell you from a reviewer point of view, the more specificity a letter of support gives, the better it is. If uh, if there's what, what I call a cheerleading letter saying, oh, this is great. I just read your proposal and I wish you the best of luck. And that the reviewers typically put less weight on that than a letter of support that says, hey, we're very interested and we're, we're willing to put some skin in the game, maybe in terms of effort, maybe in terms of subject population, whatever it is. But uh, there's no requirement. But I think the more specificity can be in the letter of support, the better. And I want to interrupt with a question. I mentioned that um, if, if, and I've spoken to a couple of applicant, potential applicants who want to submit a video or something else. So what is the, the, the SOP for SBIRs, MJ? Um, if they a... I think if there's a video, the video cannot be, First of all, that all the instructions I, I send right after I receive the applications. So in the letter, of, uh, the cover letter indicate that you you want to submit the video. So I'll have that. But all the applicants will also get guidance about how to then submit it to me. And I will put in the grant proposal, uh, the grant folder. But the, Typically, a video should not be a, an ad. That just, it's kind of just, it should add a time component to, uh, to whatever that you're trying to demonstrate. It's not just a, a video for a commercial kind of thing. More of a, a something that, that provides some kind of time lapse that would not be inferred by just text, I think. That's it. And um, there in my in the emails I sent to all the applicants once I received the application, there'll be the guidance in terms of 
how long it should be. Typically, it's 2.5 minutes or five, I don't remember exactly, but it'll be all highlighted in there. And can I, there's a size limit as well. And the, that typically MP, MP3. There used to be a embedded a PDF, but they're not anymore. Thank, thank you. Thank you both. The next question is from an anonymous attendee and it's a two-parter and states, what's the max amount of profit fee for phase one and two we can ask for and can that be used to pay an international worker? Brian, that's all to you. Hi. <laughs> yeah, that's the, um, so the maximum amount is actually a percentage. It is 7% uh, for both phase one or phase two, up to 7% um, of your total direct and your total FNA that you're requesting. So once you calculate direct and FNA, you can add up to a 7% rate. Um, so it's not a, a, a hard figure, it's a percentage. Um, and yes, the fee can be used to pay an international worker. It is not, it is a profit to the company, so it's not part of the grant. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Tony, that is it for the questions from the audience. Okay, well, we're 11 minutes over. I, I thank those who came to visit us today. Uh, as I mentioned, if you have any questions at all, um, email us. And um, Tony, do we, how do we, um, well, let's put it this way. If you would like a copy of the, um, today's presentation, send me an email and we'll try to get it to you in the next day or so. Other than that, thank you very much. We appreciate you spending a, an hour and a half with us. And thank you very uh, also for your interest in this program.